Um, always, for those of you who are new to LRA, it's a lively venue for discussion and the play of ideas. Um, several other announcements. Um, would Rebecca Powell please go to the registration desk? There's an important item there for you to pick up. Um, secondly, yearbooks on, are on sale in Collier Hall, which is in the lower level. Um, if you would like to purchase one of those, um, we're kind of on the honor system here. Um, go to registration to pay for the yearbook. The silent auction, the book auction, is also happening in Collier Hall. Um, bidding ends at 4.30 on Friday. Um, so please get your bids in and um, be prepared to win. Um, <laughs> The publishers are also in the lower level. Um, you can also walk right into the publisher's area from the Sunset Terrace. So on your way back from the beach, just mosey into the publisher's area. Um, I think that's all for our announcements. The agenda for today's session includes the presentation of the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award. This will be followed by the presentation of the Oscar S. Causey Award. And finally, Yetta Goodman will deliver the 2014 Oscar S. Causey Address. First, I'd like to introduce Taffy Raphael from the University of Illinois, Chicago, who will present this year's P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award to this year's um, 2014 recipient. Thank you, Taffy. Thank you, Pat. And um, I'm pleased to be chairing the first committee for selecting the second winner of the P. David Pearson Scholarly Influence Award. I'd like to recognize the hardworking committee members, and if you're here, will you please stand? Patty Anders, Kathy Au, Denise Boyd is recovering from knee surgery, so is not here today, Wanda Brooks, Doug Fisher, and Leslie Morrow. This award is designed to honor, in David's name, the author or authors of an article, chapter, or book written at least five years prior to the nomination and that has demonstrably and positively influenced or impacted literacy practices, literacy policies within district, school, or classroom settings. The nomination process starts with the author or someone who wishes to nominate the author or authors of a piece of writing forwarding a letter of nomination. The letter outlines the case and provides supporting evidence along with the key piece of writing and the, C the CV of the author, as well as documentation of the influence of the piece on instruction or policy. The documents are then reviewed by the full committee who then makes the final selection. And then in a little bit of a glitch this year, we let David Pearson know and then David is allowed to call the winner. This year, I sent the email to David and said, don't forget, this is a secret. <laughs> and then last night thought, I wonder if anyone told her or him. <laughs> the answer was no. So today, almost as much of a shock to the winner as to the rest of us, we present the second Pearson Scholarly Influence Award to a scholar whose impressive nomination packet, assembled by Ginny Goatley and several of her colleagues, documents the impact of her landmark study that opened educators and policymakers' eyes to the limited number and limited use of informational texts in first grade classrooms, where students living in poverty had even fewer access to this type of text. The study was published in 2000 in Reading Research Quarterly entitled 3.6 Minutes Per Day, The Scarcity of Informational Texts in First Grade. We can see the impact this study has had on both everyday classroom literacy instructional practice and in the policies that drive national standards and assessment practices. I'm sure by now you all realize that this year's award winner can be no one other than Nell Duke. We recognize this particular study with this award but want to acknowledge the subsequent 15 years that Nell has spent working tirelessly to improve literacy learning opportunities for young children. In the words of one of her colleagues, whether Nell is testifying before state legislatures, 
providing leadership to a statewide professional learning community, crafting another powerful chapter or journal manuscript, posting a blog entry for the literacy research panel, or engaging in demonstration teaching for her literacy methods class, she is steadfast in her commitments and the entire field of education is richer for her commitments. Please join me in welcoming Nell to the podium to accept her award. This is an enormous honor. It was indeed a surprise. In fact, when I got an email um, from, from Taffy saying, had you heard about the award, I thought somebody I nominated for the Oscar, Kazi, got the award, and that was the news. <laughs> so um, I was, it's quite a shock. Um, I really appreciate this. I'm so grateful to the committee, um, and I am very, very grateful to the nominators. I didn't know they did this. It was very kind of them to take the time, um, and of course, I'm very grateful to all of you for um, reading the work and for um, you know all that you do for literacy and in the aim to impact practice. And I want to say that I'm particularly thrilled to receive an award with the name of my mentor and dear friend, David Pearson, who is my hero, and so it's really fabulous to have an award in his name. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Taffy, and congratulations again, Nell. Next, we will have the introduction of the Oscar S. Causey Award by the chair of the Oscar Causey Award Committee, Lori Henry from the University of Kentucky. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is my distinct pleasure to be the chair of the Oscar Causey Award Committee. As many of you know, newcomers don't know this yet, but this is the best kept secret among the LRA community from year to year. <laughs> I believe there are only five people in the room that knew, know who the winner is today, so we're very excited to unveil this year's winner. Just as a reminder for the Oscar Causey Award, there are five main criteria. Number one is that the um, awardee has published substantial research in literacy. Number two is that that research has had an, a significant impact in literacy research, that they've published original research in literacy, that they've generated new knowledge through literacy research, and they are recognized as a leader in the conduct and promotion of literacy research. And so this is really a, a testament to our community um, to award this Oscar Causey Award to a deserving literacy researcher. And I want to recognize some of the folks that are involved in this process. We do have an award committee, but it goes beyond just the award committee members to the nominees also. The nominees um, help put together uh, packets that are sent to the committee for review. So if you've been involved in either the Oscar Causey Committee reviewing the nominees or putting forward a nomination, please stand and be recognized. Thank you for your hard work. As I'm sure many of you know who have been on this committee before, it is not an easy task. Um, we have typically neck and neck winners, and we have to make a decision on who is the most deserving for that particular year. And I'm going to introduce Jerome Harsty, who is one of our past winners, who delivered the Oscar Causey Address last year, and he is going to unveil this year's winner. Uh, as the 2012 recipient of the Oscar Causey Award, it's my pleasure to announce the 2014 recipient. The announcement of the 2014 recipient has historically been introduced through a guess who procedure in which I give clues and you, the audience, guess who is the recipient. Unlike previous years, however, I'm going to give you clues to this year's recipient, <laughs> her contributions and fame, as well as point out some flaws or bumps in the road <laughs> in his or her distinguished career. I know pointing out flaws and bumps are not normally done in giving out this award, but hey, they've never asked me to do it before. <laughs> 
First clue, the recipient is a female. From what I can tell, that should eliminate around 20% of the <laughs> LRA members. Second clue, a bump. Before the recipient's national and international fame, the recipient, by virtue of the fact that she took a position at this institution, indirectly supported these yellow devils, who, as you can see, were beating the hell out of the holy Indiana Hoosiers. <laughs> yes, I know LRE is beyond sports and politics, but just because the organization is doesn't mean I am. Here's another clue. While this year's recipient is very active in AERA, IRA, and LRA, I personally suspect she has no desire, nor is likely to become a member of the whole language umbrella. <laughs> Have you guessed who the 2000 recipient is yet? Probably not. There's probably just too many damn possibilities. <laughs> Here is a picture of this year's recipient when she was in elementary school at South Mountain Elementary School in South Orange, New Jersey. She is fourth from the left, one of the tallest girls in her class. Here is her high school graduation picture from Columbia High School in Orange, South Orange, New Jersey, where she prided herself in her perfect, quote, flip, <laughs> and was not surprisingly the secretary of the personality club. <laughs> See, we often get clues to fame in these early Probably this we help. Here is the recipient's undergraduate institution where she majored in religion and philosophy. Here is the institution in which she currently teaches and where she holds the title of Professor of Early Childhood and Literacy Education as well as Chair of the Department of Teaching and Learning. Probably looking at her major areas of research will help those of you who haven't already identified the 2014 recipient. The role of media in its relationship to language and literacy development has been an early and ongoing topic of the recipient's research. She urged those who would banish new technologies and media to shift focus towards harnessing the power of the media for positive educational purposes. A second major focus of her work focuses on the relationship that poverty and privilege plays on learning. She has particularly been interested in how informal supports like libraries and out-of-school contexts affect student learning. A third major area of research studies the relationship between access to books and media resources in young children's literacy development. The aim of this research, in her words, is to close the knowledge gap for disadvantaged students with limited opportunities for enriched experiences. To that end, she's engaged in several uh, local projects and research initiatives aimed at increasing access to print and technology in disadvantaged communities in Philadelphia. In her books allowed project, she flooded 350 child care centers with books and provided training for child care staff on techniques for enhancing children's liturgy, environments, and interactions with books. A second project involved a major renovation of libraries in the Philadelphia library system to establish technologized urban libraries that offered neighborhoods across the city with state-of-the-art books, media, facilities, and staff training. A third area of academic interest is centered around best practices in early childhood literacy and education. This has been a predominant theme throughout our recipient's career and research. While emphasizing the importance of developmentally appropriate practices, our recipient has also emphasized setting content area goals for early childhood programs. 
For some of you who still have not identified the name of our 2014 Oscar Causey recipient, here are some of the photos that have adorned the book she has published. If asked, our recipient would say that her whole career has been about changing the odds, breaking the cycle of poverty. Her single publication of this document has probably been read by more people than has ever read the combined writing of everybody currently in this hall. <laughs> the teacher and parent editions of this book have been distributed to 40 million individuals. In between her position at Michigan and now at New York University, our recipient held a position in this building as Assistant Secretary of Elementary and Secondary Education from 2001 to 2003. She was selected by this man to head up his No Child Left Behind educational reform movement. This was, in many educators' mind, a fourth bump in the road. <laughs> during, this, during this period, she became both famous as well as infamous, <laughs> along with her boss. Nevertheless, she as well as a good many LRA members believe history will show that No Child Left Behind had strong supporters who say that it brought much needed accountability and standards to the classroom with new requirements for student learning and teacher training. The major lesson that our recipient says she learned as an administrator of the No Child Left Behind legislation was that poverty trumps all. In her latest book, Changing the Odds for Children at Risk and Educating the Other America, she advocated for a broader approach to comprehension reform that encompasses not only education, but coordinated social and health services for children and families living in poverty-stricken communities. Our recipient's last area of in academic interest revolves around vocabulary instruction. She argues that at-risk students receive a lot less vocabulary work than do children in affluent areas and that most vocabulary instruction is not well thought through as it does not lead to expanded mental frameworks. Unless you have nothing to do with public education in the United States for the past 20 years, you should know that the Oscar goes to Dr. Susan B. Newman. This is a bit daunting, isn't it? A big room. Um, I want to thank the committee and all my friends and colleagues, Jerry. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Sorta. <laughs> I was in the elevator last week and we had a speaker coming from uh, the administration to talk about early childhood. And I said, oh, I was in federal government as well. And they, he said, well, were you with Clinton or were you with Obama? And so I said, Bush, silence. <laughs> I want to talk at just a second before, um, to talk a little bit, especially to those people who are new in uh, LRA. For some of us, we still call it NRC, and please excuse me for doing that. But for those of you who don't know me, um, well, you'll know that I'm a little bit shy. I am, I, I always had difficulty in front of small groups. I didn't talk in front of my class until I was, I think, in my master's education. But I was very interested in reading. I was very interested in learning a lot. And so I came many years to NRC for the first time. And um, this was a, a time where I was all by myself. I did not necessarily have a, a strong mentor. So I came by myself, and it was 
very difficult. I, I saw, oh my gosh, there's David Pearson. Oh my goodness, Rob Tierney, I think I see him. And I remember going back to my room and saying, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do this. And that night, I went out with Leslie Murrow. And Leslie has probably told this story before, but something ate her speech. And so she had to have her husband actually call in her speech for the next day. But I was in the same position because I was practicing my speech because I was going on the next day. And I had to remember two by two by four design. And I was really worried that I was going to you know, screw it up. And that worst case scenario, someone would say, what variables are in your two by two by four design? And I remember sitting with her and talking, and we became friends at that time. And it was very, very special. And since then, I also remember going on the beach and having John Guthrie say to me, you know, Susan, you have to have a hypothesis and data. You can't just have data. And you know what? That hypothesis has to be based on something. Oh, got it. And then I met Trika Smith-Burke, and that night I was just sort of wowed by her, and I had heard her speech during the day, and that night she spent time with me talking at the virtual ish, uh, um, Vital Issues um, event, and she was talking, and I was just so awed. Darn it, she's so darn pretty, and she's smart at the same time. I just hate that. But she was so gracious so gracious and so kind and such a generous and wonderful scholar and I know tonight that we are going to honor her and her accomplishments. And then finally I, I remember Dick Anderson telling me that one of the benefits, one of the things you've got to do here is learn how to write and write clearly. That obfuscation doesn't work and that jargon is not the way to write. And so he taught me a lot about writing. And finally, I met my dear, dear friends, uh, Kathy Roscos, who we met here at LRA, and my dear group, Girls' Night Out. I think they're 20 years um, in the making. So to all of these people, I want to thank you so much. You helped me. You are my university, and I will never forget. Thank you. Congratulations, Susan. Um, now, Jerry Harsty, um, again from Indiana University, will introduce last year's Oscar S. Causey Award winner, Yetta Goodman of the University of Arizona. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Yetta Goodman. LRA's 2013 Oscar Akazi winner. As not only a personal friend, but a friend to many of her friends, I have access to materials the rest of you would have a hard time getting your hands on. <laughs> with just a little pressure, Dorothy Watson shared with me a copy of Yetta's second grade report card. Three items are noteworthy. Under demeanor, the teacher had written, fussy. <laughs> Very fussy. <laughs> Many of the attributes listed on the report card were blank. It is important, I think, however, to note that under citizenship, citizenship the teacher had placed a check mark meaning needs improvement. <laughs> My favorite is the comment section. It reads, if Yetta would only stay in her seat, she might be a good student. <laughs> well, thank God she didn't. For those of us who know you, Dr. Yetta Goodman as just Yetta, no one has ever said anything that we can't believe. One of my favorite comments was by Dr. Bill Page, who once said to Yetta, 
She sees the whole world as a Girl Scout camp, and she's den mother. <laughs> I think he pegged her perfectly. Professor Yetta M. Goodman is Regent Professor of Education at the University of Arizona. Among distinguished professorship titles at the University of Arizona, Regents Professor is the highest. In 1994, Dr. Yetta Goodman was inducted into the Reading Hall of Fame. In 1996, she was named Outstanding Educator in the Language Arts by the National Council of Teachers of English. Two weeks ago in Washington, D.C., she was given the James R. Squire Award by the National Council of Teachers of English. The James R. Squire Award is a special award given to an NCT member who has had a transforming influence and has made a lasting intellectual contribution to the profession. Those of us in the know at NCT call it the Paradigm Shifters Award. It is only given to scholars who have given our field a new set of eyes by which to see. Among a cent about a century ago, John Dewey recognized that no progress in education could be sustained unless it was led by a knowledgeable teacher. Yetta is clearly that. Professionally, she is best known for her work in curriculum, early literacy learning, kid watching, reading strategy instruction, and retrospective miscue analysis. One of Yetta's lasting legacies is the notion of kid watching, not only as an alternative to testing, but as a new direction in education, a direction that encourages teachers to be professional observers of the language and literacy development of their students and to build curriculum from that base. Yetta is a major spokesperson for whole language a staunch defender of teachers who she believes should be celebrated for achieving, in a Deweyan sense, the possibilities of public education. She is also a stance supporter of students and their rights to their own language. She received her doctorate from Wayne State University in 1967. She taught in Los Angeles City and County Schools, initially working with middle school students and later with elementary age learning. After completing her doctorate, she taught at the Dearborn campus of the University of Michigan before accepting a position at the University of Arizona. She joins me in flunking retirements. <laughs> Since her retirements, which she calls re-engagement, she has managed to publish five books. <laughs> One of my favorite pictures of Yetta is this one on the Great Wall of China. In lots of ways, it says it all. It shows her in a historical context that parallels her own stature. It shows her as a force of, to contend with, not only here in LRA, but in the world writ large. Further, she's in the middle of the road. <laughs> While not blocking the road, Nevertheless, she is a sizable obstacle to contend with, <laughs> even if all you want to do is get around her. <laughs> and as always, while everybody is going one way, she's going the other. <laughs> Help me give a warm LRA welcome to Dr. Yetta Goodman, LRA's 2014 Oscar Cosby. I can't believe that I'm overwhelmed. I can't even start my own speech. <laughs> and Jerry was so kind. <laughs> and I was worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> because Jerry really does have materials that nobody else has ever seen. <laughs> uh, 
I want to make sure everybody hears. I'm always, I can't hear very well, so I'm always worried about those of you in the back. So if you can't hear, will you raise your hands so I'll know that I need to speak slower or louder, which I can do both. Um, I consider the Oscar S. Causey Award one of the great honors in my professional career. In appreciation, I wanted to give back to this audience what has been the most important influence in all of my research. In every field of research, we looked for a tool that will get us as close to reality of what we're studying as possible. For me, that tool has been miscue analysis. It transformed what I knew and believed about reading and gave me the opportunity to introduce myself as yet a Goodman researcher. It took me a long time to be able to say that out loud. In this presentation, I'm going to shift from first person singular to first person plural, because what I've learned has been influenced by colleagues with whom I've collaborated and argued many in this room. I've also been exploring the nuances of social learning which I think we need to all think about very seriously and think about how we learn together. So let me say thanks for this opportunity and to all of you who know you've influenced me a lot and to extend my own learning about literacy in all of my complexities. And I also want to say thanks to Kelly who's been helping me with will help me with my overheads and, uh, no, not overheads anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to do that. <clears throat> because I believe in miscues very much. <laughs> it doesn't say that here about overheads. In the early 1970s, Carolyn Burke and I asked the reading teacher in a school in Gross Point, Michigan, to select one of her students for us to tape record reading a complete story for a teacher workshop. She chose Gary, a 13-year-old sixth grader, and if you think about the dates I'm mentioning, you'll realize how old Gary is now. She considered Gary to be her poor, poorest reader. He read Stonecutter, a folk tale in a fourth grade basil. We told Gary that we were recording his reading and retelling so he could talk with his teachers about how kids read. I'm going to ask you to listen to Gary reading. And for those of you who want, I wanted to show you that old ladies can also use technology. You can get Gary's information on the links that are listed on the overhead, on the, <laughs> what is that? A screen, right? That's a screen? Right, okay. For those of you with electronic devices, you can pull up the complete transcript, and there are other readings that you can use over a period of time once you get there. These, these he made into blocks for building horses, horses, houses of houses and roads. It it was hard work, but the stone cutter was kind. Contented, contented, until one day when he saw the king ride by. The king was sitting. <coughs> the king was sitting in a fine carriage, and sir servants held. A sun held a sunshade of of turquoise silk with golden tuff over over him. Oh, 
The transcript of this 46 sentence, four page story maintains the visible display of the text to consider the influence of text features on reading. Most of Gary's most complex miscues in this reading happen in the first 12 lines, which you've just heard. He read the title in the first sentence slowly with careful enunciation and appropriate intonation. He split syllables in words like stonecutter. We don't consider that a miscue, but we mark them because we want to consider all influences on reading. In the lines three and four, Gary predicted building horses, self-correcting to houses and roads. In the next sentence, line four, he read con, which we call a partial, don't consider that a miscue, and then contented contented, emphasizing the first syllable, and then he self-corrected. He substituted tessels, a non-word for tassels, read bright and breathed, another non-word for breathed, and made four attempts on stonecutter. His partial attempts on words in this excerpt were almost all self-corrected, shown with a circle C. And he did that by himself. We weren't interrupting or helping him. Miscue analysis is both qualitative and quantitative. We analyze the quantity of miscue data and code the quality. How the reader's miscues influence comprehension and show control of the reading process. We code the responses to several questions, taking into consideration each miscue in the sentence. For different purposes, we have variations of questions and forms for marking and coding miscues, which are available at different sites. In the Reading Miscue Inventory Classroom Procedure, which is the one that you saw on the transcript, question one is concerned with the degree to which the sentence, as finally produced by the reader, is syntactically acceptable in the sentence and in the whole story. Question two asks whether the sentence is finally read is semantically acceptable. Question three evaluates the degree to which meaning is changed and is only asked if the sentences are both syntactically and semantically acceptable. Questions four and five evaluate the degree to which substitution miscues are graphically and phonologically similar, and in that way we get insight into the reader's phonics information. Yes, we do talk about phonics occasionally. Um, we have a statistical um, profile on the form itself. And um, although uh, Gary produced eight miscues per hundred words in this reading, which might seem high, for evaluation purposes, we always consider that he, in this case, sustained the grammatical structure of all the sentences in this story 91% of the time. He coded, we coded those syntactically acceptable. Uh, within the whole story, the 80% of his sentences were semantically acceptable. 100% of his sentences coded syntactically and semantically acceptable retained the story's meaning. 100% of his substitution miscues had high graphic similarity, which is quite high for readers making miscues. And 83% had high sound similarity. Gary was an effective reader with high percentages of acceptability and meaning change, although he was overly cautious as shown by his high percentages of graphic and sound similarity. Examining uh, Gary's miscues on the same word across the text also made uh, his problem-solving capabilities visible. The word contented occurs three times, and Gary responded to them each differently. <clears throat> Sentence 38 in the story, he read, and you, you, have the, uh, you can see the, what the text sentence was, and I'll just read what Gary read. Rain could not wesh 
wash him away. And he was con ten, cont, conted, con, conted. And then the last sentence in the story, once again he was contented, he read, once again he was continent, contented. He self-corrected contented in the first occurrence, but made different miscues on subsequent occurrences indicating that he didn't, he didn't know contented, and he knew he didn't know because he kept working at it all the time, trying to figure out what was going on. Examining miscues on the same items across a text shows readers comprehending. The term that we use to refer to how readers make sense while they're reading. Retelling represents the reader's comprehension, the process of understanding after reading. Gary's retelling without an open book was very complete, including reference to almost every sentence in the story. And if you listen carefully, you'll even hear him try to reconstruct the language of the text itself. <clears throat> okay, Gary, why don't you close the book up and tell me what this story was all about. It was about this stone cutter. He always cut on rocks into big squares to build things, to build houses and roads. And once he seen a king that had servants with a, um, a sun sheet over him to stop the rays of the sun. And um, he wished he could be the um, king. And um, this wizard in the mountains heard him. And so he was the king. And then one day the servants forgot to bring the sunshade. And the sun was real hot that day. And then he wished that he how he could how he wished he could be the sun. After his uninterrupted reading, Carolyn began to ask some questions. And she first said, What do you think the story is trying to tell us? Well, you can't be anything else without trying to be whatever you want to be. Why did the stone cutter first want to be the son or the king? Well, he wanted to be the powerfulest on the earth. Gary's reading demonstrates at, at least two miscue lessons. First, Gary showed his developing familiarity with the text, with the text itself. He had more miscues in the first five sentences than in any of the sentences he read later. Dorothy Minoski discovered that ch uh, readers make the largest number of disruptive miscues in the beginning of their reading. Those miscues show that readers need time to become familiar with author's language, style, and content. Gary showed this pattern. The quantity of his miscues decreased while the quality increased. Miscue analysis research let us question the value of inventories that base reading levels of students on the number of errors made in a series of unconnected short passages with limited opportunity to become familiar with a written text. Secondly, Gary's language and background knowledge influenced his reading predictions and miscues. At the end of our session, he said to us, you know, We've been learning a lot about Troy in class, and my teacher told us how, we ha how they had expert stone carvers who used to even make ho horses out of stone. The story of Gary's reading provides the context for my presentation. The miscue stories I tell frame lessons I've learned about reading, texts, and readers. Analyzing an individual's uh, readers' miscues after a recorded reading of a whole text documents readers' knowledge about language and reading strategy use that they have never been directly taught. Miscue analysis provides a, reader, a window into the reading process. It provides a more complete view of the reading process than any MRI machine provides when a reader presses a button in response to a flashed word or a non-word. Miscue analysis is like an anthropological dig. As miscue researchers, each time we, 
We've got a handle on the processes and structures of reading. A reader does something we've never noticed before, and we have to rethink and accommodate new insights. We gain insights into the brain at work. Miscue analysis research was developed at Wayne State University by Ken Goodman in the late 1960s. I was part of the team of graduate stu students working with him and designed the first of about 20 dissertations completed during that time. We called ourselves Miscuteers, which, <laughs> which really dates us. When I work with undergraduate students, they don't, e they don't even know who, mis who Mousketeers are. Uh, <clears throat> after I became a faculty member at the University of Michigan-Dearborn, I continued my participation at the MISCU Center. The education community in Detroit provided an authentic laboratory in which to study reading. Teachers and administrators were concerned about African-American and Appalachian children learning to read, and discussions often centered on their language variations. This became a heated issue discussed at professional meetings of teacher educators and applied linguistics, and a legal issue as well. And by the way, if you ask me later, I'll even describe near fistfights at two national conferences in sessions related to dialect issues. During this time, linguists were calling for descriptive approaches to grammar, and teacher educators were recommending involving functional uses of language in English language arts curriculum rather than out of context explicit grammar teaching. A few reading researchers were discussing the promise of recognizing reading as language, and some teacher education programs began to include knowledge about linguistics, psycholinguistics, and sociolinguistics. So Ken Goodman set out to study reading as a linguist would. He asked readers to read a whole story orally without any interruptions and found that when readers deviated from what was expected, their deviations had linguistic characteristics related to the written text in quite sophisticated ways. He called these unexpected responses miscues rather than errors, assuming that they resulted from the same linguistic cues and underlying processes that produced expected responses. What seems to be accurate reading are appropriate predictions by readers constructing a text in transaction with written language. Ken didn't invent miscues, he discovered that they were always there. Clearly miscues happened in silent reading too, but having readers read authentic text orally is close to the reality of a literacy event as we can get and study. Later, Ken realized miscue analysis was an example of scientific realism that examined real literacy events with the goal of developing a theory that explains their underlying structures and processes. Miscue analysis always involved whole authentic texts not written or rewritten for research purposes. Michael Halliday, the founder of systemic linguistics, provides theoretical support for this pro uh, practice. Halliday says, language comes to life only when functioning in some environment. We do not experience language in isolation. If we did, we would not recognize it as language. But always in relation to a scenario, some background of persons and actions and events from which the things which are said derive their meaning. For Halliday, language always functions within a context of situation. Any account of language which fails to build in the situation as an essential ingredient is likely to be artificial and unrewarding. Miscue researchers see language as taking place in several contexts, as linguists do. There's a literacy event. In the event, there's a written text with readers and authors transacting with the text. The written text has structure or grammar which makes it possible to re represent meaning. Miscues are analyzed within the context of the sentence and the sentence within the context of an entire text. As miscue analysis developed, it became obvious that all language aspects needed to be considered simultaneously to determine what influences each miscue. We couldn't separate single, simple cause-effect relationships. Miscue analysis considers three language levels simultaneously, the graphophonic, the syntactic wording, and semantic based on Halliday's systemic linguistics. In order to understand the influence of grammar on reading, we analyzed every word in all the texts we used with all, um, 
um, with readers based using Charles Free's descriptive grammar. We developed and continue to refine a taxonomy of questions to examine readers' miscues, and you saw three of them, uh, you saw the questions that we used uh, when we analyzed Gary's work. In 1971, Carolyn Burke and I published the Reading Miscue Inventory to make miscue analysis accessi accessible to teachers. Dorothy Watson joined our author team as we continued to update our work. Teachers who learn and engage in miscue analysis expand their knowledge of linguistics and build their own insights into how readers make sense of written language. Miscue analysis has been criticized because it requires considerable knowledge about language. But shouldn't every researcher who studies reading and every teacher or clinician who is responsible to evaluate the language of their students have strong backgrounds in language knowledge? Now, imagine doctors without any information about uh, the anatomy of the body, uh, you know, and yet we continue with lots of inf uh, students who don't have much background in language working with kids in reading. At the Miscue Center in Detroit, we completed three major funded studies. Two included African and European American readers from grades two to 10 in public schools in Detroit and Highland Park. The third study involved readers in grades two, four, and six, who each read two different written texts and came from eight different linguistic communities in the United States. Four were speakers of rural English dialects, and four were second language learners. These three studies yielded 576 readers, readings, 576 readers by 346 readers and resulted in the analysis of a minimum of 20,000 miscues. I'd just like to say that because you know, we, we've been criticized that there's no data in miscue analysis. Each reading was analyzed separately by two different researchers to assure inter-rater reliability. When Ken and I moved to the University of Arizona in 1975, we continued our miscue research. The original data and audio recordings from all our research studies are accessible in the Goodman Archive in special collections at the University of Arizona Library. And you're welcome to come and visit any time. And if you do, please give, give us a call. Patty's glad to um, host you, too. <laughs> the following miscue lessons from our research remain foundational to our current work. Miscue research led to the conclusion that there is a single reading process that involves the, the brain. <laughs> so let's see, I make it miscues when I'm reading right now. Uh, and, oh, and by the way, so did all the other speakers. I was uh, marking them as they were. You know. <clears throat> involves the brain selecting information from the three language levels: graphophonic, syntactic wording, and semantic to construct meaning. Variations. Those are my great grandbabies. Variations within this process are due to social, cultural, economic, linguistic, biological, historical, emotional, and instructional influences. However, there is only one way to make sense of print. All readers use the same universal reading strategies, sampling, predicting, confirming, and inferring as they transact with a written text to make sense of their reading and to produce their own internal text. These uh, conclusions are also supported by miscue analysis studies of a range of different languages, including American Sign Language and those written in non-alphabetic orthographies. Proficient readers don't read differently than less proficient readers. They are more flexible and more efficient. A number of colleagues are now using eye-tracking research in combination with miscue analysis. Expanding on Eric Paulson's groundbreaking research exploring the concept of a single reading process. For over a hundred years, literature has shown that readers fixate about two-thirds of the words of the text. Our comprehension reading model makes clear why this happens. Readers only fixate enough to confirm I'm sorry. Readers only fixate enough to confirm their predictions and then make new ones. Readers' eyes fixate on content words about twice the rate of their fixation on function words, which also provides evidence for readers' intuitive knowledge of grammar. The eye only provides the brain with information at the points of fixation. 
Uh, eye movement miscue analysis, EMMA, we call it research, shows that readers fixate on words they don't say, and they say words that they don't fixate. The brain is at work telling the eye where to look, making sense of its perceptions, and predicting what should be there. An example uh, from Eric Paulson's research, which is on the screen, shows the eye movements on one sentence for a from a story being read orally by a young adult. He reads, take polenta, a cornmeal mush often served with beans and sausage floating in it. No miscues. To hear that read orally, you think the reader has fixated on every word in order. But the eye tracker shows a very different process. His eyes fixations are shown by the dots and sequences and the sequence of fixations by the numbers written below each fixation. And although fixation durations vary considerably, fixations are seldom longer than a third of a second and can be much shorter. The reader fixates first on the, ter the determiner the, which is the third word into that uh, se sentence, as he reads this sentence orally. The saccades, the red lines connecting the dots, show where the eye moves, but again, remember, it does not take in any information during the saccades. The words the reader fixated and the order in which they're fixated are, and you see that, the, polenta, the, cornmeal, often, beans, beans, sausage, beans, sausage, floating, sausage, floating, floating, in. That's what the eye tells the brain. But the brain is already controls the eye, where the eye looks and for how long, and the mouth reports what the reader is already predicting while comprehending the text. Readers do not, the re do not read the text as a series of words, but construct their own text, which appears to be the same as the published text. The mouth is saying what the brain has constructed, which is not the same as what the eye has seen. Emma research supports that what we've learned about reading through miscue analysis, and it extends our, un our understandings of the brain. This has established another theoretical conclusion. The structures and processes of silent and oral reading are essentially the same. Eye movement patterns of silent and oral reading provide this evidence and are also supported by Emma studies that compare silent and oral reading. I encourage teachers and tutors to spend most of their reading, most of their time re doing silent reading and to provide lots of opportunity for silent reading in their curriculum. Those interested in comparing silent and oral reading or online reading are finding Emma research a very useful tool. A second conclusion relates to self-correction strategies. Although all readers use the same process to make sense of print, they vary considerably in how tentative they are, especially in relationship to predicting, confirming, and self-correcting strategies. All texts vary in complexity and density as individual readers travel through them, which supports Alan Flurkey's concept of reading as flow. The text is like a river that ebbs and flows rather than like water flowing through a smooth pipe. Reading slows and speeds up much as water does in a river. For me, the concept of accuracy and fluency is inadequate as a metaphor and counterproductive. It makes getting the words right smoothly more important than making sense. It separates the role of correction from the reader's use of the complex relationships between com predicting and confirming that provides readers with information to decide when self-correction is necessary. Readers concerned with ac ac accuracy and fluency are often not effective and efficient because they are distracted from making sense. Everything I've said may seem logical to you, but you may not be comfortable with the strong belief I've, concluding, I've concluded from the, our more than 50 years of miscue research that accuracy in reading is not a useful goal. It is, the, it is inefficient for all miscues to be corrected. Actually, in our large studies, no group of readers reading a whole text overtly self-corrected more than 40% of their miscues. Decisions about when to correct is related to how miscues influence the acceptability of the sentence. 
When readers make miscues that are fully acceptable in a sentence, they're usually unaware of their miscues. They confirm their miscues silently, they don't need to correct, and they continue reading. You do that all the time. This is especially true for proficient readers. This ad uh, adult reader read uh, for the text sentence, he missed his first shot and second shot and just kept reading. On the other hand, the highest percentage of self-corrected miscues are acceptable syntactically and, syntactically and semantically only with the preceding portion of the sentence, not with the following. Such miscues cause readers disequilibrium and are usually self-corrected. Most of Gary's miscues uh, involve such predictions, and I'm just gonna give you another example uh, where Gary read the text sentence. And the king had to wait in his carriage until the hot sun, under the hot sun. Readers disconfirm and self-correct such miscues to a greater extent than others in fractions of, sentence, of seconds. Let me repeat, self-correction strategies are rarely for the purpose of accuracy, nor do they need to be. They're for the purpose of the reader constructing a meaningful text. Another foundational principle relates to grammar. The role of grammar in language processes, including reading, is probably the least understood and most neglected aspect of reading. Since grammar is the rule governed system through which meaning is conveyed in language, readers and listeners must assign a grammatical structure to each linguistic unit to get to meaning. The intonation of young readers reveal the grammatical structures they're assigning and their tenderness to them reading and when they are reading aloud and produce a rising intonation that seems to say to the teacher, did I get that right? <laughs> intonation patterns confirm readers' intuitive knowledge of grammar. Young children have been assigning appropriate grammatical structures with written language long before they come to school. Readers reveal their grammatical knowledge through their miscues. For example, the youngest to the oldest of our students, and that from seven into second grade, seven-year-olds to 10th graders, in our large data-based studies, substituted nouns for nouns and verbs for verbs 70 to 90% of the time. Even the non-words they produce take on grammatical markers the ing's and the ed's and other inflections that they add to non-words, like Gary did with tessels for tassels and breathed for breathed. An analysis of fourth grade Arabic readers learning English as a second language in Dearborn, Michigan also sold, showed readers advancing knowledge of grammar. In a folk tale they read in English, variant forms of the word plow occur 31 times as nouns, verbs, and adjectives. Plow is read appro appropriately only 12 times by the readers. However, even when they produce non-words such as plowing, the plowing field for the plowing field, palo handles for plow handles, and blowed the field for plowed the field, and there's some additional miscues uh, on, the, on the slide, their substitutions revealed their developing grammatical knowledge. A study of determiner miscues documented the sophisticated use of grammar by second language and rural dialect readers and showed that all readers reflected functional control of the determiner system of English in their miscues. In other words, readers' miscues on determiners were most often semantically and syntactically acceptable for readers at every grade level from the second on up. Miscues involving a small set of determiners, a, uh, the, that, this, these, those, his, her, were almost always substituted for other determiners. These substitutions revealed readers' appropriate uses of definite and indefinite articles and their understandings of the noun system of English. Although seven to 10 year old readers are rarely able to explain the differences between definite and indefinite noun phrases, their miscue showed their intuitive knowledge, which supports another important principle. Reading is language and grammar is learned in the context of its use. Becoming aware of grammatical knowledge from readers' miscues provides opportunities for teachers to revalue their students as competent. I actually developed a great deal of knowledge myself about grammar and linguistics 
through my own analysis of the miscues that I've done. I've su I'm suggesting that literacy teacher education should include knowledge and understandings from linguistics about the grammatical system in reading. When a major focus, uh, while one major focus of reading research has been to gain insight into the reading process, another important goal has been to help teachers expand their knowledge about the teaching and learning of reading to support their students' reading development. We received a three-year federal grant to provide professional development for a school district in South, uh, Southern California. Carolyn Burke and I provided weekend workshops and summer programs for teachers in upper elementary grades. We prepared engagements for teachers to explore the reading process, and they used our newly published reading miscue inventory. The teachers conducted miscue analysis on their own and their students' reading and documented their growth. They used this opportunity to discover the language and background knowledge of their readers. Their instructional focus was on the ongoing curriculum that they were planning together with us to involve students in collaboratively selected theme cycles. Reading and writing were used and learned across the curriculum. The program was rated an exemplary dissemination project in the state of California. As a result of the project, teachers transformed their beliefs about reading and the focus of their instruction. Students showed an increase in the quality of their miscues and their predictions and self-correction uh, patterns. During the three years, targeted students identified in the fourth grade by standardized tests as being at least a half year below grade level had a mean growth each year in excess of one year in reading com uh, comprehension, and many students had three or four years gain in the first two years. When Carolyn and I conducted our own final interviews, the teachers agreed on aspects of their teaching that had the most impact on their students' growth and I still use this with teachers. Encourage students to focus on making sense in everything they read. Provide time and opportunity for students to engage in lots of reading and legitimatize prediction and informed guessing. Recently, Ken Goodman and I, Ken and I, consulted with secondary English teachers in the Aurora Public Schools in Colorado who are using miscue analysis and retrospective miscue analysis, which I'll say, talk a little bit about more later, with their students. Their reading writing workshop classes involved students using tablets at home and school and regular reading and writing conferences with their teachers, including conversations about their own literacy processes. Research conducted on this project resulted in transforming both teachers and students' views about literacy District-wide evaluation highlighted the growth of teachers and students. One teacher reported on her students' changes. This has changed his life because he never thought he could read. He never liked reading. He wouldn't read. He wouldn't write. And this whole year process has changed his attitude about reading. He now thinks, I can do this. I can read a grade level piece. I can have something to say in a conversation. I developed retrospective miscue analysis to formalize the success teachers had when they discussed miscue analysis and the reading process with their students. Research on RMA has shown considerable success with vulnerable readers for about two decades. In initial interviews, these readers articulate that they're not good readers, they're dyslexic, they have attention deficit disorder, they can't sound out words, they don't know any vocabulary, they don't remember what they read, they read too slowly, they read too fast, they don't look up words in the dictionary, and they can't spell either. For them, RMA is liberating as well as transforming. As they discuss their miscues with others, they learn that reading behaviors that prove that they're not good readers are the same behaviors that proficient readers also use in specific contexts. As they discover their capabilities, they realize that they are in control of the meaning that they make as they read. RMA does not teach new ways of reading, rather engages learners in discovering what they already do as readers, as literate members of society. They respond positively to teachers they believe are truly inter interested in them, and they're liberated from instruction dependency. I received an NCT Research Foundation grant to study the metalinguistic knowledge that readers demonstrate during their discussions of their miscues. The participants were seventh graders with stay nine scores of two to seven. 
Doctoral students and I met individually and re regularly with them throughout one school year. Sessions were tape recorded, transcribed, analyzed, and we learned a lot. All readers talked seriously about reading and were interested in what they were discovering. At the beginning, their views about themselves reflected instructional views of reading and negative views about themselves as readers, and this was even true for many readers in the higher scanine groups. Throughout the year, their language use became more informed as they discussed why they made specific miscues and their growing knowledge about reading, authors, and texts. Rolando, who had the lowest day nine score, was able to defend his miscues. You, read, you can see the deck sentence, and Rolando reads, Not really, said Peter. I'm sure somebody left it here because it's so boring. Rolando listened to his reading of the text sent, target sentences and responded to his reader who said, Yes, you said it's so boring. Let's talk about that. Rolando, be, and this is from a much longer uh, response, because it's so boring. It sounds better because so, it puts the word like, it's so boring. More expression with so boring. If you say so, then he must be really bored. It sounds better. We documented how these students came to appreciate their own capabilities through RMA discussions. They built confidence in their control over reading and in their reading development. This is tr was true for both the proficient and less proficient readers. Bernice, who scored in the seventh day nine in reading, initially believed that a good reader reads every word on the page correctly and does not stumble on words. During her final interview, when she was asked what she would do to help someone who had trouble reading, she said, I would kind of let them try to figure it out. Take the time to let them discover for themselves. She also agreed that she had improved on a that she had improved as a reader and then stated confident, confidently, oh, I'll read forever. It became clear that many higher scoring readers like Bernice also lacked confidence in their own abilities and in our early conversations also often commented on what the really good readers could do that they couldn't. I've discovered in presentations, even in audiences like this one, that if I asked how many believe they're excellent readers, not all hands go up, and many of them go up half-mast. RMA provided opportunities for proficient readers to revalue their own literacy identities, which has important influences on their emotional responses as readers. Perhaps this is related to students taking their test results too seriously. As we learned in previous MISQ studies, this study showed that the test scores that are given to readers underestimated our readers' reading competence. A number of colleagues, and uh, there are some references on the slide, have used RMA successfully with various adult reader populations. Studies of highly proficient Korean readers learning English as a second language demonstrated how RMA helped them discover that their competence in reading, their first language, could be used as a foundation to support their development of English literacy. We've recently been working with literacy volunteers of Tucson tutors who've been using RMA successfully with adult populations who've not been well served by schooling. Through RMA, these readers become liberated and discover how literate they already are. My dissertation research was a two-year longitudinal study documenting the reader development of six African-American readers in Highland Park, Michigan. I continued collecting and analyzing their readings and retellings for a total of seven years, and I still continue to use the data to answer new questions. Three of the children were labeled as at risk in pre-first grade. The others were average first grade readers. Carolyn Burke and Dorothy Minoski were these teach children's teachers during the first year of the study. They were eager to participate in the research and eventually became Ken Goodman's doctoral students and our research and writing colleagues. The principal wouldn't let us back in the school after Ken lured away his best teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Having a rich longitudinal database made it possible for me to attend to the reader's African-American English. Debbie Goodman analyzed seven years of dialect features in the, in the students' reading and retellings. 
We selected the sites where the African American English dialect occurs and calculated the percent of the reader's dialect features. The miscue lessons we learned expose misconceptions about dialect and reading. In second grade, Antonio, and he was such a great uh, informant, read the three Billy Goats gruff in which he produced more dialect features than in any of his other readers, readings. The, uh, and, and the text sentences, um, I put up both of them, um, but I'm gonna focus most on the second one. The second text sentence, and both of these appear three times in the story. Um, the second te text sentence is the one you should keep your eye on. During his first reading of the sentence, he read slowly, enunciating each word, stressing who's that trip, tripping over my bridge, roared the troll. Then he read it a second time and a third time. The third time he read it eagerly, and almost every dialect feature was marked. Who dat trip trapping over my bridge, roared the troll. <laughs> and after he related the story with excitement, he, talking about the troll, gonna get smacked right out of the way when the billy goat just poked his eyeballs out with his horns. A few years later, when the three average readers, including Antonio, were in sixth grade, they read a story called Sheepdog, which revealed additional insights about dialect. Sheepdog describes 24 hours in the dog's life left in charge of a herd of sheep. There are two scuffles when the dog saves the sheep from a pair of coyotes. All three readers said the fight scenes were their favorites, although Antonio and Foster were much more enthusiastic than Beth. The males had considerably more dialect features in reading the fight scene than in any other sections of the text, while Beth's percentage of dialect features was actually greater for the text portions excluding the fight scene. We concluded that the use of dialect features during reading is evidence of comprehension. Rejection of a, di a reader's dialect by teachers who insist readers enunciate endings and shift vowel sounds to match the teacher's dialect undermines reading development. It confuses readers about what is successful reading. Difference is still too often treated as deficiency. Dialect features are not consistent and variations are evident throughout the analysis. Franklin, the reader with, in my study with the highest percentage of dialect features, occurred in only one of his readings and it reached only 39%, which is high compared to his other readers and much higher than all the other readers in the study. Language is influenced by the context in which it occurs and readers' language variations reflect their sensitivity to social contexts. Our analysis convinced us that dialect has no disruptive influence on comprehending or comprehension and dialect variations are not, we don't consider them miscues. Rather, we consider that the readers, ex we consider dialect features the readers expected responses to a text. We mark these language events on readers' transcripts to discuss their implications with parents and reading professionals. Teachers need to be well-versed in understanding dialect and other variations of language in the communities in which they work. It's necessary for teachers to be knowledgeable about language variation, about linguistics and language itself, to share such knowledge with students in order to discuss ways in which all language users shift language appropriately based on social contexts. As I've revised my miscue analysis adventures and the lessons I've learned, I'm aware of the impact this journey has had on my own career in literacy research and teacher education. I still get excited when I have the opportunity to talk about readers' miscues, as you probably could tell, and to, gauge in, and to engage in yet another miscue analysis that, I love it. I believe that the more that the miscue phenomenon is understood, the more it is likely that teachers will focus on authentic literacy in the context of powerful learning experiences that students have as they read and write about the world and the teachers will refuse to spend time on sequencing and direct teaching of out-of-context abstract units of language. 
One of my goals has been to encourage you to engage personally in MISQ analysis and to organize opportunities with teachers, students, parents, and readers to introduce, to introduce them to doing MISQ analysis. When I interview to students and teachers in classrooms or workshops, I discover that it is rare for them to have listened intently to an oral reading of a whole story without interfering with the reader with corrections and prompts. Often their evaluations are based what they think they hear readers do rather than the, a careful analysis of an actual recorded reading event. I know many of you are as concerned as I am about the numbers of readers that continue to, to suffer as a result of archaic, mandated instructional practices. The more knowledgeable teachers, parents, researchers have about the reading process, the more likely it is that literacy instruction in classrooms will engage learners in the richness and joy of reading. My motivation and the motivation of those who engage in miscue analysis is, as my colleague Brian Camborn suggests, to make learning to read barrier free. And I think maybe that'll be the title of my next article. Thank you, Yetta, for an incredible talk. Um, you are indeed a lifelong researcher, researcher extraordinaire. I want to thank all of you for attending this plenary session and hope to see you this afternoon for the Distinguished Scholar Lifetime Achievement Award and Early Career Achievement Award presentations, as well as Rupert Wegeriff's plenary address, followed by the town hall meeting, and then the memorial service. Thank you very, very much to all of you and congratulations to all of the award winners this afternoon.